So I'm glad you clicked on this video because I am probably not the first one making a video on this topic. And that topic is this frosted glass you might have seen all over Twitter lately. And just a week back, I came across another tweet about the same topic, but then I thought, damn, this just looks so sexy, I have to create a video about it. So that tweet I came across was this tweet by Jeffrey, and he actually explained how he creates this within Figma as well. And then I thought, okay, this is actually really nice and really interesting to try and see if we can replicate it in a similar way within CSS. Because to be honest, I have seen all of these tweets and I never really looked into how they actually created it, probably because there were just way too many tweets about it. So what would be better than just create another video about this topic as well? So let's take a quick look at what we will be building in this video. In this video, we will be creating this frosted glass effect and we will also add some movement on there so you can really see the shiny effect. Also, I've added uh, some small, well, you could call it dev tools so we can also change up the settings a little bit and you can just see how everything works and perhaps see what you think is the nicest looking gradient. Because depending on the settings you use, you can see you can create completely different results and all of them are pretty interesting. So let's just start coding. The starting point of today will be pretty basic. We have this frosted glass text already in there, but there is no frosted glass. So this component kind of consists out of two elements. In the background, you see that there's like a gradient and it's pretty much just a regular gradient. And then over top of that, there is that frosted glass effect. So if we jump into the code, you see there is already a little bit set up. There's this div that has the height of the screen. And in there, there is this div with the H1 that has the text frosted glass. Then one other thing you also see is I made this display grid and there's also an overflow on here. So if we in a second would rotate that gradient, you won't see any scroll bar. So that is why I already added that in place. Then this display grid is actually added because that way we can overlay the text pretty easily on top of the gradient. So let's see how we can do that. Firstly, I'm gonna add another div and that is the div that will contain our gradient. That div, I'm also gonna give a role of figure because it kind of functions like a figure, like an image. And then in there, we are actually gonna add another div, which will be our gradient. First, let's add a class name to that wrapper div. And that class name will be height full as well as width full. And then we're gonna add grid area one one. And if we would go to the second div of the frosted glass component, we can also add grid area one one. And what this will do, because we're using the display grid, is it will put both of them over top of each other. So if we would, for example, add a background of red, you will see that all of a sudden both of these elements are on top of each other. And that is because we're both using grid area 1.1. But this is not about display grid, so I won't explain it any further here. However, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add in that gradient first. So let's add another class name on there. And we can, for example, say it's height 50% as well as width 50%. And then we're gonna give this a rounded for example, of three viewport width. And by using the viewport width unit, we kind of are getting a responsive border radius because the viewport is smaller if you go to a smaller device. So the rounded edges will also become smaller on a mobile phone. And then again, we can, for example, add the background red here. And then you see that we have this square, but we also want to have this square in the center. So what we can do is we can make this wrapper div also display crit and then say place items center which will then put that block in the center again. So that means that the parent container with the role figure is still full width and full height, but this element is then placed in the center. Now, instead of using this boring rat, we should of course add that gradient in there. And I think the best way is to do that in our Tailwind config. I'm gonna go into the background image property, and in there we can add a property, for example, called primary gradient. And then I'm gonna copy this primary gradient and also fix my typo here. And then you see the primary gradient that we will be using. It is a gradient that goes from top to bottom, starts at a violet color, then goes to white at 48%, then goes back to violet, and then goes to a little darker tone of violet at the end of the element. So by adding that into our Tailwind config, we can go back to our app and we can say background primary gradient. And just by doing that, and we go back to our component, we see that we already have this gradient. And this gradient will be the base where we will be lying our frosted glass effect over. Now, firstly, we can make this gradient a little bit more popping by playing around with mixed blend modes. Mixed blend modes are also, for example, available in Figma. And if you use them, you see that your element gets rendered completely differently because of the way it blends with the background. Just like Jeffrey did in his example, we're going to use mixed blend mode, hard light, 
which will already give us quite a different effect. And now this gradient just pops a lot more. And one important thing that that does is it will also influence the way that the frosted effect lies on top of it. Now, by using that mix blend mode, we can also give the text a very interesting effect too, by going into our H1. And then on the wrapper, we're going to say mix blend exclusion. And then you already see that we get this totally different effect, almost like it's an X-ray effect. And I think it looks pretty cool. So that's what we're going to use in this example. But until this far, there is no frosty effect. So that's, of course, the next thing we have to add. And this frosty effect is actually also based on a gradient. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump back into the code and then we're going to add another diff right after our gradient. This time I'm going to make it position absolute and give it inset zero, which means that it's the full width and full height. And it also means that we need to go to our parent and give this position relative because that's what it should be position absolute towards. And if we again would give this a background of red, you will see that it just spans the full height and full width. But let's quickly remove that because ah, that hurts my eyes. Okay, gone with the red. And now the gradient that we're going to use for this frosted effect is not a regular gradient, but it's actually a repeating gradient. So let's go back to our Tailwind config and then we're going to add a frost property. And in there, I'm going to paste that gradient. And if you look at this gradient, you see it is a repeating gradient. That gradient goes from left to right and starts at white with only 4% opacity. Then it goes to a black color with 40% opacity at the center of that gradient. And then it goes back to white, but only at 30% opacity. And this opacity makes it so that if we in a second are also gonna apply a mixed blend mode on here, you will actually see a really funky effect appear. And the way repeating gradient works is you can use the background size property to define how big this repeating gradient would be. And then that gradient will simply repeat itself for every X pixels. So let's go back to the app and then we're gonna add BG Frost. And let's just see what this does right now. You see that we now have this gradient that we actually just created, which goes from transparent to a black transparent and white, like we've defined, but it's just the full width. So there's nothing repeating just now. For that, we actually need to specify a background size. So let's do that by adding BG size 20 pixels which is Tillman's way to define a background size. And then you see all of a sudden we have this repeating gradient. Still, we have no fancy effect or anything, but this is the basis that will turn into that really nice effect in a minute. Let's just make it a little bit bigger. Let's make it 40 for now. And then you can really properly see that effect. So now the trick that we need to do is again use a mix blend mode. That mix blend mode is color dodge. And what you all of a sudden see by using the color dodge and because our gradient has a transparency is that all of a sudden you get this really funky effect where it looks like light is bouncing off this gradient but it's actually because of the way the mix blend mode mixes together with a gradient which results in the effect you're seeing there is then only one thing that is still missing which will make this effect even better and that is using a backdrop blur so if we go back to our frost element we can add backdrop blur of for example 20 pixels and then you already start to see that it's actually also blurring the edges dramatizing the effect even more and then one other thing that i also think would make this look really well if it's for example would be a hero is adding some fade out around the edges of the screen too uh simply because you don't see all of these lines then so for that i actually already went ahead and went into the styles.css and created a circular fade out element, which is just a radial gradient as a mask, but that will fade out all of the edges. So if we copy this circular fade out class name, and we would add that to our wrapper, then you will see that all of a sudden, all of our colors are lost. And that is because this mask kind of destroys all of the things we just did with the mix blend modes. Reason being that the mixed blend modes interact with the background of an element. And the element that has our mask right now doesn't have a background. And all of a sudden, the mixed blend mode can't reach the background anymore beyond this mask. So that means that we need to go back in here and go to that mask element and also add a background of black. And then all of a sudden, you see that we get this nice fade out effect. Now let's also add some rotation to both of the elements. So let's say a rotate of minus 60 degrees to the frost element and rotate of 12 degrees to the primary gradient. And then you already see that it starts to look really good. 
The final thing that I really would like to add is also give some interactivity that if you hover with your mouse, that actually the gloss elements move around. That way we add way more interest to this hero section. So in order to achieve that effect, I already went ahead and added in a custom hook that you can use to create this behavior. This hook isn't really part of this video because I could explain a lot about that already. Uh, so feel free to also read the comments above to see what it exactly does. Also in the near future, I will be releasing some recipe pages where you will also be finding hooks like these with some more examples as well as explainers. But for now, it means that we can go into our app and we can say const pointer props is equal to use get pointer movement. And then we pass true in here because that way it will give us a value of minus one and one based on where the mouse is. So it will be zero in the center of this element. And these props, they contain mouse leave, mouse enter, mouse move events. So that is actually what we're going to use to spread over our element. So we're going to take this and then just go to our wrapper diff and based on that and on there we spread these props. And if we go back to arc and we inspect this and then we move over this element, you see that all of a sudden we have an X and a Y CSS variable, which is actually being set by this hook. And these numbers like they're zero once you're around in the center, go to one if you're on the edges and go to minus one if you're on the opposite edges. So these numbers we can then use to calculate our own custom numbers and move this element around. And how you're saying, well, let's just jump back and start with our frost element. We can, for example, say translate X of var X, and then we're going to wrap that inside of a calc. And then you can, for example, say multiply it with 10 pixels, 50 pixels, or maybe just multiply it with 5%. So that way we get like a number that's between minus 5% and plus 5% because X is between minus one and one. And then we can copy this and we can do the exact same thing for Y. And then one thing that's always smart to do is give a fallback to your X and Y variables in case they're not set. So I'm actually going to default them to zero. And of course, it's up to you to decide if you want to make this into a Tailwind utility instead of an inline class in Tailwind, because it might not be super readable, but this is how it works. So let's go back and you already see that all of a sudden we have this moving effect. And the only thing we had to do was implement these two CSS variables and calculate a new variable with them. Pretty smooth, right? And that is pretty much the only thing you need to make this super smooth CSS frosting effect. And I think if we look one more time, it, it just looks super good. And it's actually a really interesting effect to, for example, use for a hero. Instead of having a full gradient, it could maybe also be like a logo that has a gradient that's in the background where you add this effect over. So one thing I still want to do is I want to add in some small dev tools like you also saw in the beginning of this video. So you can also play around with these elements a little bit and see what design looked best in your opinion. But remember, when I add them, you also will have a few more CSS variables that might make your CSS class names a little bit less readable, but they're only there to make these dev tools work. So for that dev tools, again, I already added that in there. And this dev tool is pretty much only an input range selector. So we have like a minimum and maximum number we can select. And then if we scroll to the top, you see that there is a few use state hooks that we're actually using to get all of these different values. And then they are returned into a custom hook so we can use them inside of our component as well as inside the dev tools. And of course, there's many context APIs that you can also use for things like this. I know, but I didn't want to make this example any more complicated. So this definitely works. So that means that we can go back into our app and we can simply add these dev tools in here. And then we go here and we say const the dev tools state is use dev tools state. And this state is what we actually need to spread onto our dev tools because we're not using context, but that's okay. And then I'm actually going to copy some inline styles and fix a typo quickly. Because what I'm doing is I'm actually setting a few CSS variables. And these CSS variables are actually based on the settings inside of these dev tools. So now we can, for example, make the blur be a variable instead of a static value. And then we can just change it with the range selector. Again, maybe not something you need, but might also be interesting if you want to make this element way more interactive. Maybe it becomes more or less blurry depending on how you move your cursor or anything else you do on the page. 
So it might still be interesting to you. So the first thing is this class section width. Let's go into this element. And then instead of saying background size 40 pixels, we're going to say background size var glass section width with a default of 40 pixels. Then the next one is the blur, which we can copy as well. And then we can say var blur or 20 pixels. Then we have the glass rotation, which is these minus 16 pixels, where we can say glass rotation or minus 16 degrees. And the same thing we can do with the gradient rotation, where we'd say again, var gradient rotation or 12 degrees. And as you can see, that's pretty much the only thing I need to do to pass these variables to Tilwind and make it use either the CSS variable or use its default value. So by doing that and by adding in this DevTools component, if we would now go back, you see that we have these controls. And these controls simply help us to change the width and size and blur and everything we want to just experiment with this a little bit. And you already see that if you change the settings too much, you see the edges of this element. So that might mean that you, for example, want to add some scale on there. So you could maybe say scale two, which you add onto the frost element. So everything becomes a little bit bigger, but it also means that the default of 40 pixels should maybe even be 20 pixels and everything should be a lot smaller. But the thing is also because you're scaling this thing up, you will also see that the effect is completely different. But then again, we can simply tweak these changes and see how everything looks and make sure that it is to our liking. And you could then even extract these settings and remove the CSS variables and use it like that. Because honestly, I think this effect looks really neat like this. So I hope that with this video, I was able to demystify all of these frosted glass effects a little bit for you. If you enjoy these types of content, definitely subscribe to my channel because I'm making a lot of cool front-end videos. And also I'm building my platform Frontend FYI, where I will be teaching you what I call the craft in front-end, including courses, but also in the near future, for example, things like recipes. So definitely make sure to subscribe to this channel, perhaps even my newsletter to stay up to date of all the new things I will be releasing. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.